Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, let's begin class with prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you again so much for your love, for your truth, for Jesus Christ, for this opportunity to, uh, to fellowship together, to share truths about your kingdom, for the freedoms that we still have in this world. And we pray that you will empower us to take advantage of the liberties while they still exist, to take the gospel message further and further to around this world to reach more people for your kingdom. Be with us today as we study that we will draw closer to you and become more effective in our witness for you. We pray in your holy name, amen. amen. So uh, before we get into the lesson today, a couple of announcements. I want to remind you about our, our new uh, codependency pamphlet. It's a great sharing tool. Uh, people are enjoying it. It's a short 12, 15 minute read, but it but it helps people see how God's principles have real life application in their world today. It's not just you know theoretical uh, for some future time. Remember our podcast, Designed for More. I hope you're enjoying that. And we've got new episodes we just uh, recorded on some, on some interesting topics and, and uh, just uh, sign up for that and have those delivered to your device. If you're in South Africa, we have a lot of resources in Afrikaans on our website, and you can go to the website under the language section, hit Afrikaans, and, uh, and Jacques down in uh, South Africa is doing a great job of translating our blogs, and, and you know periodically we're going to be updating and adding more of our blogs into Afrikaans, and you can take and send those links to your friends down there and, uh, and help share this message in South Africa to those who uh, need it in Afrikaans. And thank you, Jacques, for what you're doing down there. And then uh, the next two week weekends, I will be in Australia. Uh, the weekend of November 1 to 3, I will be in Melbourne, and we will be doing the, the Remedy Tour. I will be doing a talk on the remedy for abuse, the remedy for relationships, the remedy for our minds, the ultimate remedy, and then uh, on uh, followed by Q&A, and then on Sunday, the remedy for deception, how to protect your mind from, from media and governmental manipulation and so forth. And then that's the first weekend, November 1 through 3 in Melbourne. And then the following weekend, November 8 uh, through 10, will be in Sydney. And if you and the same same series of talks in Sydney. And if you would like that lineup, you can go to our website on our homepage. There is a link there. If you're in Australia and would like to know the venue, the times, where, and so forth, hit that link, and then it, you can download a PDF, and it will have the entire um, agenda there with locations and so forth. So we're doing lesson today. The uh, in our quarterly themes in the Gospel of John, lesson six and it is more testimonies about Jesus. And before we actually get into the lesson, last week I mentioned that, uh, that I had read in Ellen White's writings that she had referenced that, that God would bring men of, of ability or means to the, to the cause to help out at particular times. Remember, do you remember me mentioning something along those lines last week? Well, several people asked me about that reference. I didn't have it on the top of my head. I just remember it in the back of my brain somewhere. And so I went and found a couple of references. There's more than this if you dig deeply, but here's a couple that support the theme of what I was saying. The first is Councils in Hell 227. The Lord will work upon human minds in unexpected quarters. Some who apparently are enemies of the truth will in God's providence invest their means to develop properties and erect buildings. In times, these properties will be offered for sale at a price below their cost. Our people will recognize the hand of providence in these offers and will secure valuable property and use uh, for use in educational work. They will plan and manage with humility, self-denial, self-sacrifice. Thus, men of means are unconsciously preparing auxiliaries that will enable the Lord's people to advance his work rapidly. And then Gospel Worker 298, the Lord has, has made men his stewards and has entrusted them, entrusted to them the means to carry for his work. When the poor have done all they can do to advance the cause, the Lord will bring in men, men of means to carry on the work. And so uh, this is what I was referring to when, when we were talking about the principles of liberty, liberty of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. And you see out of the blue, here comes Elon Musk, who uh, uses his means to protect the freedom of speech and to protect the freedom of assembly and the and uh, protect the constitutional liberties and so forth. And so I see that as an example of men of means stepping up to carry on the work of liberty. Okay, so those are two references to support that that idea that I said. 
Our, our lesson for today asks us to read a memory text of John 12, 32, and I want us to read verse 31 and 32. So here we go. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. That's the NIV version. What is the event to which Jesus is referring specifically in this text? Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world. Well, I am lifted up from the earth. He's speaking about a specific event, is he not? Yes, no? Yes. 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 So, so what's the event he's referring to here? Resurrection. His crucifixion, when he's lifted up. So his crucifixion is the event. But notice, Jesus said that this event is the judgment on the world. How in the how is that? At the crucifixion, do we find a heavenly court being held with books being opened, legal proceedings occurring, forensic evidence being presented, judicial rulings? At his crucifixion, that's when Christ overpowered death. He conquered death. But but it's judgment on this world. Are the people of this world, including his crucifiers, going through a heavenly judgment process? Even for those who hold that God's law works like human law and God's judgment is a ruling of the record books in heaven, uh, and if this is God's judgment, are they saying that at the crucifixion, that's when the court was seated, that's when the books were open, or would those same people who believe that's what's happening say, well, no, no, the books, the court is not seated and the books are not open for some time later into the future? What, what would they say? You know the prophecy I'm referring to, right? In Daniel 7, the court was seated, the books were open. Is, was, is that happening in, at the crucifixion or is that some future event? So, so even those who take this forensic legal view, which we reject because God's law doesn't work like human law, well, how do they understand the judgment? This, this, Jesus words again, now is the time for judgment on this world. And it's his crucifixion. Well, consider Paul's statement in Romans 3, 3 and 4. If some did not believe does their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? Absolutely not. Let God be proven true and every man, every human be shown up as a liar, just as it is written, so that you, that's referring to God, will be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Paul is talking about a time when God is judged. What type of judgment is that? What kind of judgment is Paul talking about here? judgment when people are investigating God's character so the so the the judgment of intelligent beings is this a legal process no. No. an external authority reviewing records and pronouncing rulings or is it the judgment of intelligent beings in regard to whom they will believe whom they're going to trust is this not the judgment Jesus is referring to? That the liar and deceiver has cast a spell over the minds of men and a third of the angels. And the angels unfallen in heaven still have confusion, still have questions unanswered. And the only way to destroy the lies, the lies of Satan in particularly, is to reveal the truth that exposes the lies. And the lies that are to be exposed are primarily the lies about God. And thus only God himself can reveal the truth about himself. Thus, Jesus is fully God, the son of God. And the lies about God center upon God's law. Satan lied by getting people to believe that God's law functions like the laws of a creature, made up rules that require God to use power to punish rule breaking. And thus we misrepresent God as being like Satan in character, somebody who under justice sake must use power to inflict pain, suffering and death. At the cross, all of this was revealed to be a lie. God did not lay a hand on Jesus at the cross. God did not use power to harm his son. In fact, God surrendered 
Jesus to his choice to be our savior. And God stopped using power to protect Jesus from what Jesus chose to accomplish. He set Jesus free to reap what Jesus as our substitutionary savior freely chose to accomplish. And Jesus had chosen as our substitute to take our place to confront every temptation, to suffer abuse, to face the shame and despise it, and to destroy the cause of sin and death and replace it with infinite love. And the character of the father and son, their methods and principles, their eternal design laws for life are revealed at the cross because those laws are in operation at the cross, because those design laws of truth being revealed in love while leaving abusers free to abuse without coercing, without using power to inflict punishment. Those laws of God are being lived out by Jesus at the cross in real time. God's methods are lived out. Jesus, in the most abusive, unjust circumstance ever, the only truly innocent being falsely accused, perjured against, mistreated, crucified, God still does not use power to punish wrongdoing. And Satan is exposed as a liar, as the source of pain, suffering, and death. And we are empowered with the evidence and truth to make a judgment, to decide. We can choose to reject the lies of Satan and embrace the truth and thus cast Satan out of our hearts and minds by choosing to trust Jesus and open our hearts to him. Thus, Jesus brings judgment by revealing the truth, for this is how reality works. When truth is revealed to your mind, you are required, as soon as you comprehend the truth, to respond to it. And you will make a judgment in response to truth. It happens all the time. You will either respond to believe it, accept it, apply it, and follow it, or deny it, distort it, reject it, and embrace the lie. Whenever truth is understood and comprehended, we make judgments and responses to it. Isn't that right? And this is what Jesus did at the cross. He revealed the truth that brought every intelligent being to a judgment point. Who are you going to believe? Who are you going to trust? Whose methods are you going to prefer? Satan understood that the truth revealed at the cross exposed him before the onlooking universe. This is why all sympathy for him was lost in heaven, why he was cast out of the affections of the angels, not because God used external power, but because the truth settled them into the reality that Satan was a liar and a fraud and they wouldn't listen to him anymore. And he knows that when the truth of what the cross is, uh, reveals is rightly understood by humans, that it frees human hearts and minds from his power and control. It demolishes the strongholds of distortions and misrepresentations that keep us in fear. And this is why he has worked so hard to pervert the meaning of the cross into a legal payment to assuage the wrath of an offended God. Because as long as we teach Jesus died as our substitutionary savior to pay a legal penalty to the offended God, we have not yet seen the truth of the cross and our minds remain afraid of God. Any thoughts about that? That's a profound and intense statement. I think, I think one of the things that also confuses people that I've talked about with this legal transaction that they have instilled in their mind has also been that they don't fully understand or comprehend what Jesus was giving up becoming a human and what he was sacrificing, laying off his infinite self and becoming human, is in their minds, it's like, oh, he paid a fee and thereby, uh, you know, it was paid, it was transactional, and they don't understand. But in, in reality and from a law design side, we see the infinite sacrifice of Jesus, which was, we'll fully understand once we visually see it in heaven. But um, I think it's that aspect of, of what his sacrifice actually meant as, as a cross is that as he became a human being, God will never disband the personhood 
of, he, of, of Jesus ever, and so he'll always identify as a human being. And how profound of a sacrifice that an omnipotent being like that would lower himself and become a human, I think, is... <clears throat> that's, that's, I, I agree with you completely. You know, it, for God so loved the world that he loaned his only begotten son for 33 years to pretend he's a human. Exactly, hey. yeah. Is that what it says? No. And or for God so loved the world that he gave yeah. his only begotten son, who became a human, and he is not ashamed to call us brothers. He partook of our human nature. And now, who sits on the throne? Not just the son of God, the son of man. For all eternity future, Jesus retains his humanity. Yeah. An infinite being who forever lives in human form, exactly. who forever is human. Yeah, yeah it's, it, we, it's, it's mind boggling. So, so Satan works very hard to corrupt the cross into an imperialistic, Romanized legal system of payment to an offended and angry and wrathful God so that we can believe Jesus died as our substitutionary savior while we still promote the lie about God that Satan began in heaven and keeps people from trusting him. And then people don't place their trust in God, they place their trust in the mechanics. They trust in the blood, they trust in the payment, they trust in the pleadings, they trust in the robe of righteousness, they trust in, their, in, the, in the erasure of the records because the payment has been made. They don't trust in God because if God saw their actual history, then he would have to act out rashly or angrily to harm them uh, because his wrath needs assuaging. So much of Christianity has this legal theological construct that corrupts the meaning of the cross into something that still undermines trust in God. And they, in other words, they still don't see the truth and, and that allows them to make the right judgment and reject all of this penal legal stuff. One other point is that the text that we quoted, um, where it says that he will draw all men into him, in the Greek, the word men is not in the text as inspired by the Holy Spirit. That word men is supplied by the translators. So Jesus did not say he would draw all men to him at the cross, but that he would draw all unto him meaning all of the intelligences in the universe are drawn. And you see support for this in Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The cross and what Jesus was doing was revealing the truth about God and exposing Satan as the liar and fraud because he was doing more than only saving humans from sin. He was dealing with a universal sin problem to solidify the angels and their loyalty and laying the truth groundwork for the ultimate elimination from sin from the entire universe. And when we see the biblical truth that Jesus not only saving humans through his life, death, and res resurrection, but simultaneously is destroying him who holds the power of death that is the devil, Hebrews 2.14, in securing the unfallen angels and their loyalty, we recognize something much more significant is happening at the cross than a legal payment. Consider this commentary, and we're gonna really unpack some comments now from one of the founders of the Adventist church who took the position we, took, we take that God's law is design law and that what God is doing through Christ is restoring healing on uh, fixing the damage uh, that sin has done to his creation. Uh, consider this, we'll start at Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68. But the plan of redemption had a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result, in his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before the crucifixion, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. And she correctly leaves men out. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. The sin problem began in heaven 
with angels, not with Adam and Eve and Eden. It spread to earth. God's plan through Christ deals with the entire sin problem, not just the human sin problem. While the angels in heaven remained loyal, all the lies of Satan had not been exposed and refuted. Thus, doubts remained, uncertainty. Thus, in saving humanity from sin, Jesus simultaneously reveals truth that destroys Satan's lies, answers the questions, solidifies the angels in their loyalty, thus preventing the future spread of distrust and fear and rebellion when Satan and sin are finally eliminated. And the issue is over, according to this author, and I agree, it's a question of God's law. How do you understand law? Satan alleged God's law is arbitrary, made up rules requiring God to use power to punish, and this confused the angels in heaven. And the death of Christ revealed the truth about God's law. Sadly, Satan has infected Christianity with the same lie that God's law functions like human law, system of made up rules requiring infliction of punishment, and almost all of Christianity teaches that God's law is like ours and he's the source of inflicted pain and death. Continue with the quote. From the first, the great controversy had been upon the law of God. That's the question. Understand this. How do you answer this question? How do you understand God's law functions? Is it no different than humans made up rules that require external oversight and punishment? Or is it like the law of gravity, the laws of physics, the laws of health, the laws upon which reality function, constants? How you answer that question directly determines the character you attribute to God. If you believe his law functions like human law, you are then required to conclude that God is the source of inflicted death or else there's no justice. And then you're in contradiction to the Bible because the Bible says Satan is the murderer, that the power of death is the devil's, Hebrews 2.14, that the last enemy is death that Jesus destroys in both 1 Corinthians 15 and in 2 Timothy 1.10, he destroys death. But yet if you hold the lie that God's law works like human law, you have death originating from God. He is using death to punish sin. But when you have design law, you understand that life is built to operate upon the laws that are built into the fabric of reality. And if you break away from them, then the only result is ruin and death. Death doesn't come from God. It comes from breaking his designs for life. From the verse of the great controversy, from the first, the great controversy had been upon the law of God. Satan had sought to prove that God was unjust, that his law was faulty, and that the good of the universe required it to be changed. In attacking the law, he aimed to overthrow the authority of its author. In the controversy, it was to be shown whether the divine statutes were defective and subject to change, what kinds of laws are subject to change, human laws, made up rules, they're subject to change, or were they perfect and immutable, unchangeable? Those are design laws. This is the opening, this is the beginning, this is the issue. And, this, and we're going to jump, we're going to come back and finish the Patriarchs and Prophets quote, but just to validate my point, I'm going to give a couple of the quotes from the same author. This is out of Desire of Ages 761. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed, that justice was inconsistent with mercy, and that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. What kind of a law requires the infliction of punishment? If somebody jumps off the Empire State Building, taking themselves out of harmony with gravity and physics, does somebody have to have a trial, um, present evidence, and then have a judicial ruling and then sentence them and inflict punishment? No. If somebody decides to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, they sneak behind the barn, they hide it from their parents, they're breaking both the rules and the laws of the land, and they smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, does somebody have to punish them or are they punishing themselves as they're destroying their health? When you understand design law, nobody has to inflict punishment. This idea of inflicted punishment is only required when you have laws that are not built into reality, like you do 35 in a 30 zone, you don't pay your taxes, you jaywalk, et cetera. It sounds, and so, sorry. pardon? I was about to say, it sounds like Satan in his jealousy was unsatisfied with reality 
and therefore he was the first one to create a fantasy to that's right that's exactly right and this is the fantasy he wanted to ascend it says in, in isaiah he wanted to ascend to the throne well he doesn't have the natural capacities of the in, of an infinite being to govern so the only way a, a finite being can ascend is through artificial rule Uh, thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 109. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening, something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There's perfect unity between them and their creator. Obedience is to them no drudgery. Love for God makes the service a joy. So in every soul where, Christ, where in Christ the hope of glory dwells, the words are re-echoed. I delight to do thy will, O God. The law is within my heart. So what kind of law is in operation and beings are in harmony with it, but they don't even know about it? Design law. Yeah. yeah, this is design law. So again, I give the example of Isaac Newton discovers, not creates the law of gravity. And he's so excited to discover the law of gravity. He goes to tell his friends, I've discovered the law of gravity. Can't you see his friends as he's explaining the law of gravity going, huh, wow. Gravity is a law? I've never thought about it like that. It's just how things work. And that came as an awakening. God has a law? Wow, never thought about that. It's just how things work. That's design law. But Satan perverts it and suggests it's imposed rules with inflicted punishments. And then in the opening of the book, The Great Controversy, um, Ellen White writes the following. The Great Controversy is between Christ, the Prince of Life, the author of our salvation, and Satan, the prince of evil, the author of sin, the first transgressor of God's holy law. Satan's enmity against Christ has been manifested against his followers. The same hatred of the principles of God's law, the same policy of deception by which error is made to appear as truth, by which human laws are substituted for the law of God, human made up rules, and men are led to worship the creature rather than the creator, may be traced in all the history of the past. Satan's effort to misrepresent the character of God, to cause men to cherish a false conception of the creator, and thus to regard him with fear and hate rather than love, his endeavor to set aside divine law, leading people to think themselves free from its requirements, and his persecution of those who dare to resist his deceptions have been steadfastly pursued in all ages. They may be traced in the history of the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, the martyrs and the reformers. Understand, if you believe God's law functions like human law, and therefore God's justice is holding a judicial heavenly tribunal, examining records, determining guilt and innocence, sentencing people to the various lengths of suffering, using power to torture them as long as they deserve before he kills them for their sin crimes, you're not worshiping a creator, you're worshiping a creature. That is Satan you're worshiping. I don't know how to say it more clearly than that. Is that not what she just said? When you substitute man's law for God's law, lead them to worship a creature rather than the creator? This is what's at stake, and this is why. And then notice in the same book, Rick Connors 582, notice this. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Upon this battle we are now entering, a battle between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah, between the religion of the Bible and the religion of fable and tradition. Fable is fantasy, make-believe. Human laws are fantasy. They're make-believe. They're like going out and playing a game of baseball. There is not, uh, no why the game of baseball does operate on the laws of physics. The rules of baseball are just made up fantasy rules. 90 feet to first base instead of 30 feet. Uh, three strikes and four balls instead of four strikes and five balls. It's all just made up artificial fantasy that makes a game. Uh, so too are human laws. They have some connection to the design laws of God. Traffic laws are connected to the laws of physics. But why is it a red light instead of a, a blue light that means stop? It's just all made up rules. Uh, that, that are artificially and require oversight and external enforcement. And in fact, if you run a red light and there's no traffic, what harm is done? 
Who got hurt? If you're out alone, all, all by yourself, there is no harm from running a red light. The harm comes in the potential uh, or when somebody else is coming to the green light and you hit them. And so enforcing that, that traffic is, is not because you actually caused harm then, it's because you broke a rule and we want to protect from future harm. Those rules have a logical, rational place for order in our society, but they're just made up. Everybody following that? Cam? And so, it, yes. I'm not sure how to phrase this, but you know, in, in relation to the laws of gravity and respiration and some of that, we're not fallen, but we're somehow fallen when it comes to moral laws. And I don't know how that enters in. Yes, what you're saying, so it, for the example, we still have built into our biology a natural desire to breathe. You don't actually have to think about breathing. You have in your brainstem autonomic, autonomic nervous system that will automatically breathe for you. You actually have, you have to purposely choose to hold your breath or to tie a plastic bag over your head not to breathe, to break that law. So naturally, you're in harmony with the law. Understanding God's original design in Eden, when God has his way and fixes the damage in us, it will be as natural for us to love others and live in harmony with God's design as it is for us to breathe. Right now, because of what Adam did, we all inherit a spirit, a life, the breath of life. God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And the breath of life, the spirit, the animating energy that Adam had in Eden was the, the motivation of love. That's how he came into the world. And, and he loved naturally. There is no effort to love. There's any more than there's an effort for you to breathe. You do it naturally. But Adam contaminated himself. He chose to believe lies and he changed his animating energy from love to that of fear. As soon as they sinned, they ran and hid because they were fear. They were full of fear. Fear leads to selfishness, the ant antithesis to love. And it says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, that we did not, God did not give us a spirit of fear. He did not give us animating energy, the breath of life of fear. We, but God gives us the spirit of, of power and of love and a sound mind. No, we got the spirit of fear because after Adam and Eve changed themselves from love to fear, the only animating life energy they have to pass along to others when they procreate is a spirit of fear. Thus, we're born in sin, conceived in iniquity. We're born with animating energies of fears and insecurities that make us driven. So our natural state is fallen. The carnal heart is enmity to God. And so we naturally now live the life of the first birth until we're reborn. And when we're reborn, we receive through the Holy Spirit a new animating energy, the spirit of love and trust. And now within ourselves, we have the ability to choose. We can choose with our willpower to say yes to the Holy Spirit, yes to the spirit of truth and love, and no to the animating spirit of fear and insecurity. And over the course of time, our individuality, our neurobiology, our sense of self, our habit patterns are rewired and we become automated and certain things that we did before we knew Christ they're, they're repulsive to us. We don't do them automatically anymore, even though we're still tempted by fear and insecurity. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can process it all. Well, that's, that's why it's so important to understand the foundation that God's law doesn't function like human law. That's right. It's like, and one day we will throw off this mortal and take take on immortality. And when that happens, then there the old vestiges of what we inherited from Adam will be gone, and we will live and will be as easy for us to love as it will be to breathe. It's just natural way we work, and there will be no contaminating elements to tempt us anymore. So continuing on the with the with the, the patriarchs and prophets quote. This is what we. I took a little pause to show and support, but this is the paragraph we already read. From the first, the great controversy had been upon the law of God. Satan had sought to prove that God was unjust, that his law was faulty, and that the good of the universe required it to be changed. In attacking the law, he aimed to overthrow the authority of its author. In the controversy, it was to be shown whether the divine statues were defective and subject to change or perfect and immutable. And we just went through further explanation from the same author, subject to change, made up laws. Immutable, 
design laws. Everybody with me on this? This is the question. And then we continue on for the next paragraph in Patriarchs and Prophets. When Satan was thrust out of heaven, he determined to make the earth his kingdom. When he tempted and overcame Adam and Eve, he thought that he had gained possession of this world because, said he, they have chosen me as their ruler. He claimed that he was, it was impossible for, for uh, that forgiveness should be granted to the sinner, and therefore the fallen race were the his rightful subjects, and the world was his. But God gave his own dear son, one equal with himself, to bear the penalty of transgression, and thus he provided a way by which they might be restored to his favor and brought back to their Eden home. Christ undertook to redeem man and to rescue the world from the grasp of Satan. The great controversy begun in heaven was to be decided in the very world on the very same field that Satan claimed as his. Now, thinking through design law, you notice I highlighted certain words like said, claimed, um, rightful, and so forth. This is Satan's position. His positions are based on claims, on declarations, on proclamations, on statements, on uh, presumed legalities and rights and so forth. That's what he does. He asserts, and they and he takes it and puts them in a legal framework. He claims humans chose him as their ruler, as if our choice could change reality and make Satan into our creator and Satan the sustainer of our being. Think that through. You see, so many are, I can't tell you how many Christians buy into this lie. Uh, well, yes, uh, he, Satan is now their ruler because they're sinful. And No, they, Satan was never the ruler. He claimed it. He, he usurped and tricked them, but he is not the sustainer of reality. All things don't hold together through him, do they? So he claims that forgiveness, notice again, claims that forgiveness is impossible. He claims that we are his rightful legal subjects. And notice that Jesus bears the penalty of transgression, not the penalty of God upon sinners for transgression, but the penalty that naturally comes from breaking design law in order to restore humans back to harmony with heaven. He took the sinner's place, took the terminal condition upon himself for the purpose of eliminating it and restoring life back into humanity. Continuing on with the quote. It was the marvel of all the universe that Christ should humble himself to save fallen man, that he who passed from star to star, from world to world, superintending all, by his providence supplying the needs of every order of being in the vast creation. Uh, again, can Satan do that? No. That he should consent to leave his glory and take upon himself human nature. Again, this idea that he wasn't loaned, he became human, was a mystery that the sinless intelligence of others' worlds desired to understand. 1 Corinthians 4, 9, we are a spectacle, a theater to angels and to men. Very biblical idea here. When Christ came to our world in the form of humanity, all were intensely interested in following him as he traversed step by step the bloodstained path from manger to Calvary. Heaven marked the insult and mockery that he received and knew that it was Satan's. Inst it was at Satan's instigation. They marked the work of counter agencies going forward. Satan constantly pressing darkness, sorrow, and suffering upon the race, and Christ counteracting it. See, this isn't declaration or claim that Jesus is doing. Jesus is bringing judgment by what? By evidence, by revelation, by action, by accomplishment, by facts, by applying the principles of God. He's revealing truth, and as truth comes, people have to decide what's going on, what's happening. They have to think, they have to reason. Notice that they watched the battle between light and darkness as it waxed strong. And as Christ in his expiring agony upon the cross cried out, it is finished. 
A shout of triumph rang throughout, through every world, through heaven itself. The great contest that had been so long in progress in this world was now decided, and Christ was conqueror. His death had answered the question, the un unanswered question, whether the Father and the Son had sufficient love for man to exercise self-denial in a spirit of sacrifice. Is God really love? Will God truly altruistically love? Is God a being who sacrifices self for the benefit of others? Or is God a being who's so powerful that it costs him nothing to give what everyone else needs because he's an infinite being and he only pretends to love as long as you don't ask questions. But boy, if you ever question something he doesn't want happen, oh no, he's not love anymore. I mean, this, this is the, the deal here. And his death had answered the question. Satan had revealed his true character as a liar and a murderer. It was seen that the very same spirit with which he had ruled the children of men who were under his power, he would have manifested if permitted to control the intelligences of heaven. With one voice, the loyal universe united in extolling the divine administration. Satan is the author of pain, suffering, and death. Satan is the murderer from the beginning. Hebrews 2.14 tells us that Jesus destroyed him, holds the power of death. And Jesus destroyed our last enemy. And in Timothy, it says he destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. Yet most Christians still believe the lie about God's law that it's imposed and therefore teach the lie that God, in justice sake, must use death to punish sin. And some even teach that God killed Jesus on the cross to pay our legal penalty. Continue on with the quote. If the law could be changed, man might have been saved without the sacrifice of Christ. But the fact that it was necessary for Christ to give his life for the fallen race proves that the law of God will not release a sinner from the claims upon him. If it was arbitrary made up rules, well, let's amend the, let's amend the law, let's change it. It's like human law. How many times do you see human law being changed to avoid some consequence of some sort? But design law, you can't change. It was demonstrated that the wages of sin is death, not the punishment of God for sin. The wages of sin, the result of sin. When Christ died, the destruction of Satan was made certain. But if the law was abolished at the cross, as many claim, then the agony and death of God's dear son were endured only to give Satan just what he asked. Then the prince of evil triumphed. His chain charges against the divine government were sustained. The very fact that Christ bore the penalty of man's transgression is a mighty argument to all created intelligences that the law is changeless. What kind of law is changeless? Design law. That God is righteous, merciful, self-denying, and the infinite justice and mercy unite in its administration of his government. God's law cannot be changed like the law of respiration. If someone jumps into the ocean with weights tied around their legs, the law of respiration cannot be changed to meet them in their circumstance. The individual has to have something done to them to restore them into harmony with the law. That's the only way to save them. And that's what Jesus came to do, is to restore the living law of God back into the species human. And that's what the Bible says. The new covenant, he will write the law in our hearts and minds. God works through Jesus to do this, not to pay a penalty to himself for the law, but there is a penalty that comes from the broken law. And Jesus at the cross experienced that penalty. And that penalty is separation from his father, which was necessary for him to experience in order for him to destroy the infection of fear reveal his self-sacrificial love, restore the perfect law of love into the humanity he took upon himself and fix all the damage that sin caused. Does everybody follow that? There is nothing penal legal going on. God is not inflicting anything upon his son. And thus the Bible says in Hebrews 5, 9, once Jesus was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Wasn't he always perfect? He was always sinless. But Bible perfection is about maturity of character, and character cannot be created. It must be developed by the free will choices of the sentient, sapient being. And Jesus, as a human, as the second Adam, was sinless, but he was tempted in all points like we are. And at the cross, he chose to love perfectly and destroy the, the spirit of fear that he inherited through Mary and solidify his humanity into perfection. 
perfect, mature human character who would rather die eternally than break away from loyalty to his father and, and then break his father's design law for life. All right, Sunday's lesson, it asks us to read, oh, sure, the last paragraph says, John 3, 31 to 36, continues the comparison between Jesus and John, showing the superiority of the Messiah over the forerunner. With John's testimony pointing forward to Jesus, the idea of witness against uh, is again emphasized. Those who receive that testimony and believe in Jesus have eternal life. Those who do not receive and remain under the wrath of God. That's what the text says. God loves loves the world and sent his son to redeem the world. But those who refuse the gift offered them will have to pay the penalty for their own sin, sin's eternal death. What do you hear in this paragraph? Human law. What law lens are you, uh, yes, hearing this through? That's exactly right. The lesson references uh, John 3.36, which reads, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. That's the NIV version. Well, then we have to ask, what is God's wrath? And how do you understand that? Depends on which, how you understand law. If we believe God's law functions like human law, made up rules that require judicial oversight, enforcement through penalties, then we conclude that God's wrath is the use of power to inflict pain, suffering, and death as punishment. But that is Satan's wrath. When Satan is wrathful, he uses power to punish people. When we understand the truth of God as creator and his laws are design laws, the laws that reality operate upon, then we understand that God's wrath is the exact opposite of Satan. Satan uses power to cause pain. God stops using power that has been restraining the pain, suffering, and harm that sin would cause if God's power wasn't being exercised to protect them from it. So Satan uses power to cause pain, God's, that's wrath. God's wrath is the cessation, the stopping, the ceasing of using power that has been holding at bay the pain and suffering that would come. And this is what the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed against all godlessness and wickedness of, uh, of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then Paul tells us that they... they the wrath comes because they reject the truth about God. They preferred lies. They preferred images made with their own hands. So in four, three times, verse 24, 26, and 28, Paul tells us what God does. Therefore, God gave them up. Therefore, God gave them up. He let them go. He stopped restraining the consequence. He let them reap what they sowed. And that's what Paul says in Galatians 6, 8. Those who sow to the carnal nature, from that nature reap destruction when God ceases his intercessory protective role and stops using power to hold the destruction at bay. God's wrath is letting go. Satan's wrath is inflicting harm. And Paul ties all this together in Romans 4.25 when Jesus as our substitute is, and depending on your version, delivered over, or excuse me, delivered up in the New King James and English Standard Version, delivered over in the NIV, handed over in the Good News, Revised Standard and Living, and given over in the, in the New English. But that's how they translate it. But it's the exact same Greek he used in chapter 1, verse 24, 26, and 28, when he said God gave them up. And so it makes it hard for the English reader to realize Paul is saying that at the cross, Jesus was given up. And that's God's wrath. God's wrath on Jesus did not cause infliction of harm, it removed his sustaining life, sustaining and, and um, protective presence and allowed Jesus to experience the harm that comes when God is no longer protecting him. And Jesus confirms those with his own words at the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, given me up? Not why are you harming me? Now consider these historical quotes and God's actions that are consistent with what I just showed you from scripture. This is manuscript release 731. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which, in, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The wrath of God fell upon Christ. This was the hiding 
of the Father's countenance. Do you understand how many Christians teach that God's wrath is actually harming his son at the cross? Even within Adventist literature, even within our own review, even as, as much as, as a year ago in the at last December's review, I read a, a quote where it says that God killed Jesus on the cross to pay our legal penalty. That's because they all operate, all those who say this are operating on the original lie that God's law works like human law. And we have a message given to this church to take to the world, to call people back to creator worship. And that is done when we reject all this penal legal mumbo jumbo, this idea that God's law is imposed or made up rules and come back to recognize his laws of the protocols of which reality work. Here's Patriarchs and Prophets 728. David had neglected the duty of punishing the crime of Amnon and because of his unfaithfulness, uh, the unfaithfulness of the king and father and the penitence of the son, the Lord permitted events to take their natural course and did not restrain Absalom. When parents or rulers neglect the duty of punishing iniquity, God himself will take the case in hand. His restraining power will be in a measure removed from the agencies of evil so that a train of circumstance will arise which will punish sin with sin. Have you ever read that before? How does God act to punish sin? Not by using power, but by re by setting people free to reap what they, if they won't do the right thing and they insist on going the wrong way, what's the only action love can take is to let them go that way and reap what they've chosen. Here's another one, Review and Herald, September 17, 1901. God bears long with rebellion and apostasy of his subjects. Even when his mercy is despised and his love scorned and derided, he bears with men until the last resources for leading them to repentance is exhausted. But there is are limits to his forbearance from those who to the end continue in obstinate rebellion, he removes his protecting care. Providence will no longer shield them from Satan's power. What are the limits to God's forbearance? He just gets tired. He's really not an infinite being. He really is not exhaustless. He really doesn't have all power. It just runs out one day. No, the obstinate rebellion that sears the consciences and destroys the faculties of the sinner such that no more amount of truth and love poured out will be responded to. They can't respond to it because those faculties have been destroyed by their rebellion. Then it doesn't matter how much more truth, love, patience, because there's nothing left in the sinner to respond. That's the limit, the limit beyond which no more truth and love can redeem. And that's what, and then keeping on, God keeps a reckoning with the nations, not a sparrow falls to the ground without his notice. Those who work evil toward their fellow men saying, how does God know, will one day be called upon to meet long deferred vengeance. Oh boy, here it comes. In this age, a, a more than common contempt is shown to God. Men have reached a point in insolence and disobedience which shows that their cup of iniquity is almost full. Many have well nigh passed the boundary of mercy and soon God will show that he is indeed a living God. He will say to his angels, no longer combat Satan in his effort to destroy. Let them work out let him work out his malignity upon the children of disobedience for the cup of their iniquity is full. They have advanced from one degree of wickedness to another, adding daily to their lawlessness. I will no longer interfere to prevent the destroyer from doing his work. Wow. <clears throat> I mean, this is reality. This is design law. Think about it, parents. If you have a child that goes into rebellious living in every discipline, every pleading, every action of redemption, of mercy, of grace, of kindness, of love, of seeking to, but they continue to rebel. In the end, what's the only loving thing you can do? Let them go. And if you let somebody go and they break away from the very protocols of life, what's the only outcome? And that's what God's wrath is. Yeah. Monday's lesson. Yeah, the Jews look, pardon, somebody has something to say? Question. Why do you think Jesus said on the cross, why have you forsaken me? Would he not have, 
did he not know what the plan was? I mean, why did he say that, do you think? Why have you forsaken yeah. me, God? Yes, that's his humanity crying out and how he was feeling in the agony of his soul. And if you read in Desire of Ages, she goes on to say that this was the, the moment of his deep agony where the temptation was great. But she goes on to say that he then re recalled all of the evidences that, so he did not forget any of that. And then she said the sense of his father's disfavor was removed and he died a victor. Remember he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit before he died. So he, he, so that's just one statement, but it's not the end of the story. Before he died, he surrenders his spirit into his father's hands, does he not? Mm -hmm. So he knows he's not cast off by God. He knows he's, that this is the emotional abandonment when the fire hit father hit his face for the purpose of him achieving the goal. And he's agonizing about how horrible that feels. Why, uh, so um, first paragraph, Monday's lesson. The Jews looked for a Messiah to come who would deliver them from the rule of Rome. Long under oppression, the Jews believed that the Messiah would not only overthrow Rome, but would establish them as a great and powerful nation. John's words, however, call, calling Jesus the Lamb of God, although directly pointing to his atoning sacrifice, were probably misunderstood by the majority of people. They might not have known that he was what he was talking about at all. Why do you think the Jews who are blessed with the 39 books of the Old Testament, all of which taught the truth of the coming Messiah and the nature of God's eternal kingdom did not understand? Why did they look for a Messiah who was like a human dictator? They believed the lies of Satan that he was telling about God. That's what the if we could go back to Christ's day, let's say we had a time machine and we went back to Christ's day and, and uh, you know, the weekend leading up to the crucifixion, at the crucifixion, uh, before Christ actually dies and rises, we could find the scribes and Pharisees um, who were persecuting him uh, and ask them the following questions. What, what would you surmise their answers to be? If you were to say to them, before, be, before a Christ, Christ's crucifixion, do you want the promised Messiah to come? What do you think they'd say? Do you anticipate the Messiah doing away with sin and evil or promoting sin and evil? What do you think they would say? No. Uh, would you like for the Messiah to do, would, would, if you ask the, ask the, the scribes and Pharisees, the ones who crucified him, would you like the Messiah to do good or to do evil? What, what do you think they would have said? Good. And then if you said, what is the good you anticipate the Messiah to do when he comes, what do you think they would have said? Vengeance. Vengeance that he is going to come to punish rebellion. He will destroy the wicked. He will overthrow the enemies of, of God and his God's people. Uh, he will rule the nations with a rod, hot rod of iron from the throne of David. Don't you think they would say something like this? Yeah. And what law under, uh, underlies that methodology of governing? Is that design law or imposed law? And if you ask Christians today, are you looking forward for Jesus and Messiah to return? Oh yes, oh yes. When he comes, will he do good or will he do evil? He'll do good. What would you like him to do when he comes? To do good or do evil? Oh, to do good. And what is the good that you want him to do? To use power to kill our enemies, to overthrow those who are abusing God's people, to take a rod of iron and rain from on high. Do you see that they were looking for the exact same authoritarian dictator that the Jews did and it led him to crucify Christ? But Jesus said when he was here that the kingdom of God is not of this world. It doesn't operate like this world, that the kingdom of God is within us. And he had already revealed through the prophets that God wins not by might nor by power, but by the spirit, says the Lord. And the spirit is the spirit of truth and love. And it wins people to love and trust. What God wants is he wants people to to love him, to trust him, to understand him, to be loyal to him, to be friends with him. And you cannot get that by using external force upon people who don't love and trust you. We have been given a special message at this time in history to prepare the world for Christ's return. And that message is a call to call people back to creator worship and stop worshiping this imperial dictator, rule maker, inflictor of punishments. And then consider this historical quote in connection to the special message of the three angels that we are to take to the world at this time in history. This is from Testimonies, Volume 3, 161. 
men and women cannot violate natural law, that's design law, by indulging depraved appetite and lustful passions and not violate the law of God. Therefore, God has permitted the light of health reform to shine upon us, that we may see our sin in violating the laws which he has established in our being. Not just the physical laws that govern our physical health, but the laws that govern the operations of our minds and hearts and relationships that operate in our being. All our enjoyment and suffering may be traced to obedience or transgression to natural law. We can see that if you live an unhealthy life and you get physical disease that you're suffering, but can't you see that if you cheat on your spouse and you have a divorce and you can't see your kids or et cetera, et cetera, you violate those laws in your being that you actually suffer more than, than you do when you have physical illness? Okay, all the suffering that we have is because somehow we're out of harmony with God's design laws. Our gracious heavenly father sees the deplorable condition of men. Some knowingly, many ignorantly are living in violation of the laws that he has established. And in love and pity to the race, he causes the light to shine upon health reform. He publishes his law and the penalty that will follow the transgression of it that all may learn and be careful to live in harmony with natural law. He proclaims his law so distinctly and makes it so prominent that it is like a city set on a hill. All accountable beings can understand it if they will to make plain natural law and to urge the obedience of it is the the work that accompanies the third angel's message to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. Wow. We cannot give the third angel's message set in the human imposed penal legal payment system. We can only give the third angel's message when we're setting it back in design law, how reality works, the laws of God for our being. There's a whole lot more in the lesson uh, that uh, that we could go into. Um, let's see if there's anything that I, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and so forth in the rest of the week. But but I'll let you review those in the notes this afternoon or tomorrow when Dean puts them up. Let's close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are the creator and your laws are the constants, the protocols the never changing immutable designs that you have built into reality. And every one of them is for our health, our well-being, our happiness, our joy. Lord, we ask that the spirit of truth will bring home to our minds the truth. Help us, help us to be freed from this fear and insecurity and the distortions of an imperial fake law system and help us understand the laws that you've designed into our beings that we can intelligently cooperate with you and joyfully live in harmony with them and experience the abundant life and make us a effective lights at this time in the world to take the truth about your protocols, your character, your heavenly kingdom to this world so that the world will be lighted with your glory and you will come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.